catechesis is adult catechesis because adults are able to understand and then are able to pass it on to the children. Okay, so I think in a lot of our parishes we need to reorient ourselves, rededicate ourselves to serious education in the Catholic faith, and then we will begin to change the culture and the generation that's younger than us. Um, and so I want to thank Father Cregan especially for welcoming us and inviting us here to the parish. All of the institute programs at the parishes we go to are offered at no charge to the parish and no charge to attendees so that we're able to open up the doors uh, to anyone who wants to learn about uh, the truths of our faith, about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ at the Institute of Catholic Culture. And I think that tonight's topic is a prime example of this. We are not ashamed of our history. We are not ashamed of our story. We are not ashamed of our teachings. We are here to explain those teachings, to explain our story, yes, with all of its warts and with all of its glory also, to be able to tell the truth about who we are as Catholics, to be able to bring the message of Jesus Christ to a world that is hungry and in need of that message, the saving message of our Lord. Our wonderful speaker tonight, um, Mr. Christopher Check, is the Executive Vice President of the Rockford Institute in Rockford, Illinois. He holds a degree in English Literature from Rice University. His writings have appeared in many publications, including This Rock, The Wanderer, and the Chicago Tribune. He's addressed audiences at the University of London, the Pontifical Augustinian University in Rome, the Serbian Writers' Union in Belgrade, the National Pl Press Club, Catholic Answers, the American Chesterton Society, Legatus, and Ave Maria, and none of those compare to the audience that he addresses at the Institute of Catholic Culture. Please welcome Mr. Christopher Check. Thank you, Father Gino. Well, you're doing me a great honor. How's that? Does it sound okay? No? You want me to talk louder? That's up to Keith. <laughs> He'll turn it up. Uh, there's a handout. I think we ran out of them, so share with your neighbor. It will, as I like to say, help you follow along or give you hope that the talk is coming to an end. That will all, it'll also be posted on our website uh, tomorrow morning. Very good, very good. Uh, before, before I begin, I want to tell you a story. Last time I was here uh, it was April, uh, February or March for the talk on Athanasius. And uh, I told you a story how I met Bishop Laverde in the airport and he was telling the Holy Father about the good work of the Institute for Catholic Culture. Um, after I got back from that talk on Athanasius, about two or three weeks later, I got an email from a young man in Bakersfield, California, of all places. Um, you know, the home of Dwight Yoakam, right? <laughs> and, uh, and, and he told me a story. He is a convert. And uh, with the zeal of a convert, he had taken over the RCIA program at his parish, which was, you know, a little thin on catechesis. And he said, he thanked me for my lecture on Athanasius, told me how much he liked it. But, the, but he wanted to say how much the Institute of Catholic Culture's website helps him, and the lectures that Sabatino puts up there, helps him prepare for his RCIA classes and to evangelize all the way out there in the land of Dwight Yoakam in Bakersfield, California. So when you write your check to Sabatino tonight, the effect of that check is, is making its way. I, could, could, we, could we be in the continental United States and be farther away from any other place in Bakersfield, California? I mean, it's almost the exact other end of the country. So what is that? How many tens of thousands of dollars do you have to spend on that website a year, Sabatino? So, Write, write him a large check because it's reaching well beyond, well beyond the Diocese of Arlington and, and Washington, D.C. All right. If you, uh, if you make a habit, if you make a practice of defending the faith... Oh, wait, I have one more commercial. <laughs> My latest recording back th is back there on the war, the war in the Vendee. It's very similar to the story of the Cristeros and uh, that and some other ones. But the, the newest one, I know many of you have the complete collection. They're the newest ones back there. And you must subscribe also to Chronicles, the best magazine in all the languages in the world. 
$19, 20 issues, and you get a free one if you subscribe. So 13 issues, 20 bucks. There's no better deal. If you make a habit of defending your faith, defending the holy Catholic apostolic faith, sooner or later, in, in the course of conversation with your opponent, be he a, an atheist or a Protestant or a Jew or a lapsed Catholic or a lukewarm Catholic, sooner or later, your opponent's going to pick up one of two clubs with which to beat the Catholic Church. The first one is the Crusades. And this one has always puzzled me, and I know a lot of Catholics today, even, even you know, some uh, good practicing Catholics, kind of feel a need to apologize for the Crusades. And this is something that I've, I've never understood. The Crusades were proclaimed by the Holy See. They were called by the Pope not only to aid the, the Byzantine Empire uh, in his war against the Seljuk Turks, but also to liberate the people of the Holy Land, the citizens of the Holy Land, from the yoke of Islamic tyranny, the land where our Lord was born, walked, worked miracles, taught, was executed, rose to the dead, ascended to heaven, was under Islamic rule. And we sent, we sent knights from the West to go and liberate it. And I've never understood why people want to apologize. And two other reasons the Crusades were called. One was to redirect the energy of the warrior class of the Christian ages. You know, I know if you've heard me talk before, you know, I like, that, I like to say Christian ages, not Middle Ages, right? Because Middle Ages, as if nothing happened between antiquity and the Renaissance, we had a thousand years where nothing happened, right? No, the, to redirect the energy of the warrior class of the Christian ages toward the service of God. And most importantly of all, to give the men of that warrior class a means to atone for their sins by which they were heavily burdened. And I was in the Marine Corps for eight years, and any of you here who have had military, military service know that that is a life that, where it's very easy to accumulate a lot of sins. So, so our, our church was, was helping these men, was helping, so, so I don't understand why people want to apologize for this. Now, if your opponent is a little alert, he'll say, well, what about the sack of Constantinople in 1204 in the Fourth Crusade? And then you say, fine, just like Blessed John Paul II said, when someone from the West contemplates contemplates a Latin knight putting to sword one of the Greek members of the mystical body of Christ, whether in schism or not, of course that should cause us pain. Of course that should cause us pain. But the point here, my friends, is that the individual actions of men involved in an enterprise does not itself condemn that enterprise, does not itself condemn that enterprise. Otherwise, we would have to do away with the whole of the Catholic Church because, so far as I know, everyone associated with the Catholic Church, with the exception of her founder and his blessed mother, have led sinful lives, have led sinful lives. Now the reason I take the time to belabor this point about the Crusades is because tonight's topic, the Inquisition, that's a problematic expression and we'll, we'll come to that in a moment, but Fall, the, the Inquisition falls into the same category as the Crusades. That is, it was something good. It was something good that was proclaimed by the Holy See, that was called by the popes, and for good reasons. For good reasons. Because in the course of rooting out and suppressing heresy, the church's inquisitors fell from time to time into wicked excess, the whole of the Inquisition has received from John Fox, you know, Fox's Book of Martyrs, right, to Bonaparte sympathizer Juan Antonio Llorente, from Edgar Allan Poe, to Charles Lea, from Monty Python, all the way to Mel Brooks, a universal or near universal denunciation. But justice requires that in evaluating the Inquisition, we examine not just its historical record, which by the way, I will argue tonight, will return a favorable judgment, but its motives especially. We have to examine its motives. 
And if we make an effort to do both, we'll find that the Inquisition, like the Crusades, is far from being an event for which the faithful should need, feel the need to apologize. It was a moment in the history of the Catholic faith when the fervent, the devout, and the pious loved so much the church and her teachings and longed so much for the salvation to which they led, declared war on heresy and on those whose lives imperiled the social and political order of the kingdoms of Christendom and worst of all, imperiled the salvation of her citizens. Imperiled the salvation of her citizens. So like I say, let's start by clarifying this word inquisition, which is mis misleading because throughout her history the church has had several inquisitions. Historians divide them into three. One we'll call the medieval inquisition, then the Spanish inquisition, of course, the, the most notorious, and then the inquisition that becomes the holy office. Indeed, Pope Benedict XVI, right, effectively served as the, the grand inquisitor of the Catholic Church when he was, when he was head of what? So yeah, right, Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, exactly. The Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, which, of which Cardinal Ratzinger was once prefect, was once called the Supreme Sacred Congregation of the Holy Office, and before that, it was called the Supreme Sacred Congregation of the Roman and Universal Inquisition. So, Benedict XVI used to be the Grand Inquisitor, all right? So we don't need to apologize. But a word today that conjures singular impressions of a network of spies and informants, torch-lit dungeons where victims of ruthless torture writhed in pain and innocent Jews and Protestants were consigned to stake and flame. This word inquisition in, in fact means nothing more than inquiry, than inquiry. Obviously, they have the same, re same root. And courts of inquiry today aim to determine the truth or the falsehood of a matter before the law. The Inquisition, or better, as I say, Inquisitions, of the Middle Ages and the Renaissance sought to determine the truth or heresy of a theological or doctrinal claim. Today's Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith does just that. The difference is that centuries ago, the faithful regarded heresy as a serious threat to the mystical body of Christ, one that disrupted the community of believers, and worst of all, I'm belaboring this point, worst of all, worse than anything, threatened a man with eternal damnation. Now, by the way, this understanding that I've just described was not confined to a few religious fanatics. What ebbed and flowed throughout the first centuries of the church was the reaction to that threat of heresy. And by the way, the idea that a false teaching, the idea that a heresy endangers the well-being of a people is not a uniquely Christian idea. It's pre-Christian, in fact. Plato said that any citizen who didn't adhere to the religion of the ruler needed to be sent away to school for five years until he got his mind straight, all right? The Romans regarded detractors of the state religion as what? Treasonous treasonous. And you only need skim the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Did I get those in the right order? I'm a Catholic. I think that to see the seriousness with which the Jews of the Old Testament regarded violators of the Mosaic Law. And when one considers the special role that the Jews played in salvation history, that is to hold the knowledge of and to organize the worship of the one true God and to be the people to whom the Messiah would come, it's hardly surprising that the Mosaic Law dealt harshly with heresy. We see a striking example in Exodus when Moses returns from Sinai and they're having this orgy, really, in front of the golden calf. What does he do? He smashes the tablets on the golden calf. He has the golden calf melted down. He grinds it into powder. He makes them drink it. He makes them drink it. And then what does he say 
And he said to them, Thus saith the Lord of God, of, uh, the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword upon his thigh, go, <coughs> go and return from gate to gate through the midst of the camp, and let every man kill his brother and friend and neighbor. And he, and he, who does he tell us to? The sons of Levi. Why? Because they are the ones who hold the doctrine, right? These are the first Dominicans. We're going to come to the Dominicans later, all right? But it's the sons of Levi, the people responsible for holding the doctrine. He tells them to go. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And there were slain that day about three and 20,000 men. Now, whether you wish to take the figures that Moses wrote down, literally, or not, we can conclude that many heretics that day were put to the sword. And by the way, without benefit of a trial or anything like that. Why? So the children of Israel would not fall into error. That's why. And there's another example near the end of the, near the end of the Exodus story. Well, in the book of Numbers, chapter 25, we read of the fate of Jewish followers who have fallen into the cult of Bielphagor, which is another one of these, you know, uh, cults devoted to decadent behavior. <clears throat> Moses spared them not. And Israel was initiated to Bielphagor, upon which, and now God talks. The Lord, being angry, said to Moses, Take all the princes of the people and hang them up on gibbets against the sun, that my fury may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said to the judges of Israel, Let every man kill his neighbors that have been initiated into Bielphagor. And there were slain that day four and twenty thousand men. So Moses was the first inquisitor. Moses was the first inquisitor. Now, lest we're tempted to think that these old, this Old Testament justice does not influence Christian thought after the resurrection, we should note that St. Paul, in his first letter to the Corinthians, is explicit in holding up this very event in the book of Numbers to the people of Corinth, who have what? Fallen into similar rites of temple prostitution. St. Paul is hardly more tolerant of heretics than was Moses. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he decries the factions that divide early Christian communities. And in his letter to Titus, he's explicit that a heretic who's been given two corrections must be separated from the ecclesia, right? Avoid him, Paul writes, knowing that, his, that he is perverted and sinful and condemned by his own judgment. St. John, St. John is also clear in his rejection of the heretic. In his second epistle he writes, for many seducers are gone out into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a seducer and an antichrist. Whosoever revolteth and continueth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. If any man come to you and bring not this doctrine, Receive him not into the house, nor say to him, God speed you. Now it is so that for the first millennium of the Christian church, the church was in the main patient in her treatment of heretics. Although I would argue, we heard about the death of Arius when I spoke here last, I would say the, de that the, the very unpleasant death that Arius endured can only be interpreted as divine judgment. St. Augustine saw a role <clears throat> for what he called godly magistrates in dealing with the treacherous. But he also urged clemency for Donatists who were burning Catholic churches in North Africa. Pardon me. But nonetheless, <clears throat> in these first few years, first millennium of the, of the church, excommunication and exile seem to be the worst sentence that a heretic might face. But then a development in history takes place. The church and the state, or more properly, the church and the empire, become identified more and more with one another. They, they became ever more united and they're inevitably developed an underlying and strongly held and completely reasonable belief that the enemies of the church 
were now also enemies of the state, of the empire. William Thomas Walsh, whose book I recommend to you, writes, puts it this way. In the Middle Ages, there was a genuine separation of church and state, but it was a separation of functions, not of principle. Not of principle. So united in principle. Edward Peters writes it this way. The conversion of the empire had transformed the church, and the absorption of the church had transformed the empire. Now, before we can try to understand the Inquisition, we have to try to put ourselves in the, in the mindset of the man who lived in this age. It is indispensable for us, all of us formed in the modern age, in trying to make sense of the Inquisition, to contemplate what the transfor transformation of the empire in Christ meant to the typical member of the faithful at that time. In other words, how did he understand his life? And how did this understanding influence the political and social life of his age? Okay, this is the question that we have to answer. So, it's going to be useful, and I know some of you have heard this, but it's going to be useful for us to note that at some point in human history, a divide takes place between the ways of man's understanding of himself. All right. Now, some historians use the category medieval and modern. For medieval, you could substitute Christian or classical or classical Christian. But we'll say between medieval and modern, at some point, beginning in the Renaissance, all right, and this is a simplification, man stops thinking of himself in terms of his relationship with his creator and be, starts to begin to think of himself in terms of his relationship with, well, himself, himself. And this picks up speed and gains ground in the Protestant rebellion, right? Where now every man is the arbiter of what? Of, the, uh, 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 of, of, of scripture and sacred doctrine. What he reads in the, what I read in the scripture, I am the arbiter of, all right? And finally, what traces of classical Christian man persisted in the 18th century were smashed in the revolution in France. Jean-Jacques Rousseau declaring, the very fact that I feel a desire, I have a right to it. The very fact that I feel a desire, I have a right to it. In other words, man's total self-absorption is complete. And this is the modern world, this world that completely celebrates this abstract idea that doesn't even exist called the individual, right? In which everyone in this room has been formed, whether we like it or not. But it is important to realize that medieval man did not understand him, himself as we do. He understood himself to be created by God for the purpose of one day being united with God. And he lived among an entire community of human persons who understood exactly the same thing. And this understanding informed all levels of human experience. The corporate religion then informed all levels of human experience. Men cooperated with one another as they mutually worked out their salvation. Thus, enemies of the corporate faith were enemies of the society. Indeed, enemies of the common religion were considered guilty of treason, just as they were among the ancient Romans. <clears throat> so, if we can imagine such a world and living in such a world, oh, please, be wonderful, right? If we can imagine such a world, we're going to have a lot less difficulty when we confront the events of the 12th century. For it is during this time that the enemies of the faith who became <coughs> energetic enemies of Christendom revived some of the old Manichaeism, came west from Bulgaria and Albania, and settled in large numbers in northern Italy, southern France, and the cities in the Rhine Valley and southern Germany. These heretics go by several names. Among them, 
Albigensians, named for the city in France, Albi, where they, which was a hotbed of, and Languedoc, which was their, uh, um, uh, the hotbed of their heresy. They are also called Cathari or Cathars, which derives from the Greek word Katharos, Katharos, which means pure. Now the Cathari believed in two gods, the good god who created and ruled the spiritual world, so it sounds like Manichaeism, right? <coughs> and the evil god who created and ruled the material world. And according to the Cathars, all matter was evil. Thus they denied the incarnation, right? Because why would our Lord, we talked about this, uh, some of these early heresies when we talked about Athanasius, why would our Lord assume a body if the, if the world of matter was evil? So they denied the Incarnation, uh, and deriving from this, of course, they denied the Mass, because the use of bread and wine at Mass, well, these are material things, so they deny the Mass. The human body was evil, therefore marriage, which united human bodies and made more humans, was evil, was an evil institution. They taught that man should try to escape the material world. Suicide, there was actually a right of suicide, that was common among the Cathars. And <clears throat> it will come as no surprise to you that a sect that taught that marriage was evil had no small number among its members who practiced infanticide and indulged in unnatural vice as well as rampant fornication. Now the Cathari were divided into the elect and then the simple believers. And the simple believers were the ones who were not pure uh, and so, not being pure, basically, well, where does that, con where does that lead? <clears throat> You're pretty much free to do whatever it is you want, as long as you die with, they had one sacrament, it was called the consolamentum, which was kind of a last rites. As long as you receive this poor death, you're okay. So go wild, get the consolamentum, and you're in. The Roman Catholic Church, of course, which preaches something significantly different, the Cathars saw as an energy of the, uh, uh, an agent of the world, and they declared war on it. And because we had this unity of state and church, right? The princes of Europe. In fact, very specifically, they declare war on the whole feudal system because they refused to take oaths. And, and necessary to the success of the feudal system is taking an oath. Now, by the end of the 12th century, the anarchy and savagery and the secret blasphemous rites of the Cathars created a firestorm of political unrest and dissent. Cathar bands sacked churches, they desecrated the Eucharist, <clears throat> and whenever this happens, the church is a little slow to react, but the faithful are not always slow to react. And so they took matters into their own hands. And the faithful ended up as perpetrators of mob violence, to which too often the innocent would fall victim. I stress this point, why? Because in forming what eventually came to be called the Inquisition, the church was every bit as concerned with protecting the innocent as, from zealous mob justice as she was with rooting out heresy. Now the local bishops and the local clergy weren't up to this challenge. So Pope Gregory IX enlisted the help of the aid of an order founded by a brilliant Spanish priest named St. Dominic, whose order of preachers God providentially raised up at this moment to fight heresy. Now, have you all heard that joke about the woman who meets the, she's a, she's a Protestant, she meets the two priests on the, on the train, and they're sitting opposite her, and she says, uh, are you Catholic priests? And, and one of them says, yes, um, I'm a Jesuit and my friend here is a Dominican. And she said, oh, I, I never heard of that. And can you explain to me what you do? And the Jesuit says, well, the Jesuits were formed to respond to uh, the heresies of the Protestant Reformation. And, uh, and then, so she turns to the Dominican and uh, she says, okay, well, I get that. Well, what's the difference? What's a Dominican? And, the Dominican says, uh, well, the Dominicans were formed to respond to the Albigensian heresy. And the woman says, well, I've heard of a Protestant, but I've never heard of an Albigensian. And the Dominican says, that's the difference. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so God raised up the Dominicans. <clears throat> that joke doesn't count against my time, Sabatino. <laughs> American historian Charles Lea was the first one to put together uh, a, a, a serious history. It's very anti-Catholic, but a serious English-speaking his history uh, using the Inquisition's abundant primary source documents. His four-volume history is not sympathetic, and yet he acknowledges the wisdom of using priests the Dominican order because he says they were wholly free, wholly, W-H-O-L-Y, from local jealousies and specially trained to the detection and conversion of heretics and dead to the enticement of pleasure. Now, among the Dominicans were a few Franciscans. They preached sound doctrine and examined before their tribunals men accused of heresy. They used Roman legal methods from the age of Augustus. They gathered evidence. They examined witnesses. Like so many other things in the organization of the church, the Inquisition finds its origin in the organization and administration of the Roman Empire. Indeed, this very word, Inquisition, comes from the Latin Inquisitio, which appears in Cicero, but by the age of Augustus has taken on a special meaning. The formal search conducted by officials of the court to assist the magistrate in gathering evidence. Now, these very procedures were performed by the medieval Inquisition. Pope Gregory, both sympathetic and hostile, historians agree, did not intend to set up a permanent office of an Inquisition. He was responding to this particular Cathar heresy. <clears throat> Rather, the Inquisition developed organically as the Dominicans went about their often dangerous work. Not a few uh, Inquisitors, Dominicans were assassinated. The most famous of them, St. Peter Verona, also known as Peter Martyr. You, if you've ever seen images of him, he's got a big cleaver in his, in his skull, who was brutally murdered by, by Cathar hitmen. Heretics who were found guilty were offered the opportunity to recant and repent. To the state, the heretic was a danger to society, right? A threat to the social and the political order. To the church, what was he? He was a lost lamb who needed to be brought back to the fold. He needed the mercy of God. Only the heretics who were obstinate were sentenced to death. But the church herself did not shed blood. Recalcitrant heretics were given to the secular authority which put them to death, and yes, by burning at the stake. Hardly an invention of the medieval inquisition. It was a common method of execution throughout Europe. Far from being ruthless men who derived pleasure in the suffering of their victims, the church's inquisitors were selected for their reputations, for spotless moral conduct, patience, and learning. So heavy was the burden of the decision of life or death that an inquisitor carried that the church took pains to send her best into this work. The most notorious of the medieval inquisitors, Bernard, the Dominican Bernard Guy, uh, uh, our, our whole knowledge of him, or legend of him, comes from Umberto Eco's completely unsubstantiated novel, The Name of the Rose. They made a movie about it. It's pure fiction. The real Guy wrote a guide for, for, the, the, for inquisitors to follow the strict procedures he set down in his book, The Practica, Inquisitionis Heretice Pravititatis, or Conduct of the Inquisition into Heretical Wickedness. It, walks, it walked inquisitors through actual uh, records of interrogation, and he shows, he lists the deceitful methods the way Cathars and Waldensians would dissemble and avoid answering questions. His work was refined by a Catalan, Nicholas Emmerich, whose Directorium Inquisitorum also includes transcripts of interrogations. And it would be Emmerich's guide that they, would use, that they would use in Spain. Now, how did this medieval inquisition operate? Arriving into town, the inquisitors uh, would declare a term of grace, a period of grace lasting somewhere from two weeks to maybe a month and a half, something like that, during which heretics could come forward and confess their sins. If, if they had harbored private doubts, well, it was effectively like a confession, and they would be given some kind of a private penance. If they had given public scandal, then they would be given some kind of a public penance, like wearing a large cross, for example, helping to build a church, going on a pilgrimage, something like that. To demonstrate the sincerity of their confession, people who came before the Inquisition were then asked to give the names of other heretics. I mean, we're here to root out heretics, so we got to find out where they are. So, okay, give us the names of some other people, all right? At the conclusion of the period of grace, 
the, any of the accused who had not come forward of their own free will then were tried. Trials followed, as I said, a very careful procedure. A minimum of two witnesses, but often more, would be required, although yeah, often there were many more. Now, unlike our current judicial system, the anonymity of witnesses was protected, but there was a reason for this. The Cathars, in particular, were in the practice of assassinating witnesses. So, witnesses, the anonymity of a witness was protected to, you know, to protect his life. Perjury was dealt with as severely as heresy. There's an instance in, in Guy where a, a father is imprisoned for wrongly accusing his son. By the 14th century, the accused were given benefit of counsel. By the way, this is one of the miscarriages of Joan of Arc's trial, miscarriages of justice. She was denied counsel. They were permitted to provide a list of their enemies. And if any of their enemies were on the witness list, then those witnesses would be discounted. The bishop had to review all the trial documents, and then the verdict had to be reviewed by a jury of men, sometimes as many as 80 strong, called the bonivari, or the upright men, men of good standing in the community. The accused also had, an appeal to, had the right to appeal to Rome, something else, by the way, that Joan of Arc was denied. All in all, far from being ruthless, arbitrary, and capricious, the medieval inquisition, because of the work of Guy and Emmerich, and because of the close supervision of the papacy, and because of the training and sanctity of the Dominican inquisitors, was the most meticulous, advanced, and progressive court of its time, far outstripping in care and procedure the secular courts of Christendom. But, objects the skeptic, there was torture. There was. There was. Now, the modern imagination so strongly associates torture with the Inquisition that we tend to think these methods were the invention of the Catholic Church. They were not. They existed in the Roman Empire. What is more, torture was an instrument of inquiry in all the secular courts of Europe. If the, Inquisition should be rem if the medieval Inquisition should be remembered for torture, it should be remembered that for the first 30 years of its existence, uh, torture was, was not used. It only employed torture in the middle of the 13th century. It was permitted by Innocent IV, Alexander IV, and Clement IV in succession. Three popes, all of whom insisted no threat to life or limb. A doctor had to be present. Torture could be applied only once and for a limit of 15 minutes. Now, were these rules broken? Of course they were. Of course they were broken. Like every rule is broken. By a handful of cruel inquisitors whose actions have sullied the memory of this enterprise. But as, but as the abundant records and manuals show, the church was explicit in limiting the use of torture. In using torture as a last resort, we have to understand the church had two objectives. The first was to find out the veracity of a charge, just as in our own day. The courts of the Inquisition sought, in the absence of evidence or witnesses, a confession to a crime. But confessions given under torture would have to be repeated the following day after the person had been set free. But mostly the, chur the church wanted to restore a soul to the church. And torture was used only in the most obstinate of cases. From the first, by the way, there was a debate about the merits of torture. Emmerich thought that confessions received under torture were probably of little value. And when we look at the trial of the Templars, by the way, there, there we realize, obviously, these men were, 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 were put to confess things that they had not committed. Now, whole forests have, been given, have given their lives describing the terrors, real or not, of Inquisition torture. We don't need to belabor them here. They are repellent to our senses, and yet to this day they are defended and used by modern governments. The tortures of the medieval Inquisition included, along with denying food, the strapado and the rack. The strapado, the victim's wrist, would be tied on his back. He'd be hoisted up to the ceiling. It would dislocate the shoulders, and then they'd drop him by a series of jerks. And then, of course, the rack, a triangular frame that stretches the body. Usually, if the accused were shown the instruments of torture, that would be sufficient to get a confession. Torture was used in a small percentage of cases. By the beginning of the 14th century, Pope Clement V, the first Avignon Pope, was requiring the local bishop to approve torture before it could be used. Charles Lea admits that in the source documents of the medieval Inquisition, the references to torture are few. The medieval Inquisition came of age in the glorious 13th century. They gave us Thomas Aquinas, Dante, and Giotto. It protected Christendom from the social and political chaos 
and it saved who knows how many souls from damnation. By the mid 15th century, its procedures were so well refined that we can see in the trial of Joan of Arc, for example, that when the Inquisition's methods were violated, right, a grave miscarriage of justice takes place. But when they were respected and carefully followed, as in her rehabilitation, then justice was served. Now, as St. Joan's good name was being restored by the Inquisition in the middle of the 15th century, another threat to the peace of Christen, the Christian West and to the salvation of her souls was taking place on the Iberian Peninsula. It would be in Spain that the Inquisition would persist until the 19th century and the events for which it is best known and most understood would take place. Now the medieval Inquisition had been very successful in Spain. The Cathars had made their way into Aragon and uh, Emmerich uh, made pretty short work of them. And so after, uh, after uh, the 14th century, uh, excuse me, after the 13th century, we find no mention of heresy in Spain. To be sure, Spain was frying bigger fish at the time. Now, no people's history lends itself well to summary. And I know my friend Brendan McGuire has been here giving a good history of Spain. The history of the Spanish people is horribly tangled. And what is more, the story of Aragon is not the story of Castile, is not the story of Al-Andalus. For seven centuries, beginning in 711 AD, the Iberian Peninsula, originally a land of Greeks, Romans, Carthaginians, Visigoths, <clears throat> was a sometimes battleground and sometimes uneasy coexistence of m Christians, Muslims, and Jews. When the three religions got along, there was an atmosphere of what Spaniards called convivencia, right, or mutual tolerance. Though the relations were always among unequals. Christians lived under Moors, Moors lived under Christians, Jews under both. But acts of charity between the groups were not uncommon, and there are even episodes of all three religions praying together, for example, when there, were, when there was a, a famine or, or a drought. As Christian Spain, however, begins to take back the Iberian Peninsula from her Muslim conquerors, and as the nobles of Spain, driven by greed, begin to rebel against the authority of the kings of Castile and Aragon, a turmoil of political, religious, and social, and racial discord sweeps across Spain. At the moment when these people who had been struggling for seven centuries to recapture their land from Islamic occupation seemed on the verge of descending into chaos, God intervenes and creates one of the great marriages of history. And the future of Iberia and indeed of the New World is saved for the cross. When Queen Isabella I of Castile was joined in marriage to King Ferdinand II of Aragon in 1469, these young monarchs faced several threats. The Moorish Kingdom of Granada was resurgent and sending forth with increasing impunity bands of Moors into southern Spain. Portugal is about to declare war over the succession of the Castilian throne. Aragon and Castile were internally divided by complex civil wars of feuding nobility. Bands of freebooters preyed on Spain's poor. And behind much of the intrigue that characterized the confused time was a community of people, the loyalty of which was not clear. These people were called the conversos. And the Inquisition in Spain cannot be understood without first recognizing, one, this condition of wide political unrest that I've just described to you in the second half of the 15th century, and the role of the conversos in Spanish society. The conversos were Christians of Jewish origin. In other words, they were Spanish Jews who had been baptized some of their own free will, and not a few, we have to admit, under duress. The word converso also is used to describe descendants of these people. So we would say someone of converso blood. Now, how did these Jews come to be baptized? Well, in the 13th century, the conviv conv convivencia that marked the relations of Jews, Christians, and Muslims in Spain begins to break down as the Christian reconquest gains speed and ground. Even so, St. Ferdinand, King of Castile, what does he call himself? The King of the Three Religions, right? He, when he took Cordoba, Cordoba from the Moors, he gave the mosques to the Jewish people to use as synagogues. Jews in Spain, although the minority, made up the single largest Jewish community in all of Europe. 
although they were certainly deeply involved in finance, Jews in Spain were farmers, they were craftsmen, as well as shopkeepers, tailors, and doctors. During periods of Islamic resurgence, during the ebb and flow that was the Reconquista, Christians and Jews doubtless saw themselves, at least informally, aligned against what? Islam. Even as Christian rule became more established and the Reconquista proceeded, Spain does not witness the kind of anti-Jewish legislation seen elsewhere in France, where the Jews were obliged to wear a yellow patch, uh, a, a yellow round patch over their hearts. When England expelled her Jews in 1290, and France did so in 1306, Spain did not. Spain did not. Nonetheless, three things. Exorbitant rates of Jewish usury. It's a fact. The active Jewish management of the slave trade. And Jewish social separatism provoked resentment among all classes of Spanish Christians from the wealthy down to the peasant. Economic privations of the civil wars exacerbated the situation. And then a distorted sense of national religious purity among the old Christians provoked, provoked again, like with the Albigensians, mob action against the moneyed classes. Jews fell victim to pogroms in Seville, Sevilla, and Cordoba, Cordoba, in Valencia, and in Barcelona. And the result of these pogroms was, at the point of the sword, Jews were offered baptism. Large number of Jews in the year 1391 to avoid mob violence accepted baptism. And this strange hybrid, the converso, was created. All right, so this all is taking place 100 years before the, the Spanish Inquisition started. But this is how the problem begins, all right? Now, so great were the number of conversions that it's hard to believe that most of these were sincere. The church, of course, opposes a soul being constrained to be baptized. And in Aragon, the king declared that the forced conversions were unacceptable, and any Jews who wished to return to their faith were free to do so. Many conversos, however, finding themselves now in better social circumstances, at least safer, or also believing that their apostasy from Judaism made them unfit to return to Judaism, volunteered to remain Christians. And we have to underscore two points here. The conditions under which these Jews became Christians in the 14th, in 14th century Spain cannot be praised, all right? We're not here to praise that. That being said, the reason for which so many Jews remained Christians were far from genuine. The result was a class of people, the conversos, who were distrusted by Jews and would eventually become distrusted by Christians. Conversos, being of energetic and resourceful stock, thrived. They remained active in finance. They took over the medical field. Most of the nobility of, of Spain had converso doctors. They were tax farmers. They managed the various treasuries of the realm. In time, these conversos began to intermarry with the old Christians. By the way, this is a very important point because when you hear arguments of racial prejudice being one of the, ins one of the inspirations of the Inquisition, it's total nonsense. Christians and conversos married freely with one another during this period. They be, many of them became devout class, Catholics, they became clergymen, they became monks, bishops, and nobility. The principal chroniclers of this age, the historians of this age, most of them are conversos. Ferdinand II was of converso blood. As the ranks grew, a growing number of Jews voluntarily converted. There's the scene of the famous debate in Tortosa in 1414. The Pope was there where some learned Dominicans squared off against these rabbis and they said, you know, uh, uh, thousands of Jews accepted baptism of their own free will. The converso culture assumed, however, a kind of pride that ballooned into arrogance. Because they shared the ethnicity of our Lord, they regarded themselves as, as, as superior to the old Christians. There was a converse who became a bishop, Alonso de, Car de Cartagena, who in the practice of reciting the Hail Mary would say, Hail Mary, Mother of, uh, Holy Mary, Mother of God, and my blood relative. <laughs> Pray for us sinners. You can, you can hear him saying, my blood, you can hear him saying it. What is more, the conversion of many of the conversos was, to say the least, incomplete. 
They were not well catechized. So what did they do? They retained a lot of Jewish practices which continued to exacerbate the divide between the new and the old Christians and created divisions among the conversos themselves who so, and, and, and who created divisions among the conversos themselves between those who had accepted the Christian faith whole and entire and the Judaizers, those who insisted that the Jewish practices needed to be maintained. A question, by the way, settled long ago in the Acts of the Apostles. Henry came and says, the principal anti-Jewish polemicists of the age were ex-Jews. A second reprisal takes place. Beginning in 1449, bands of old Christians squared off against bands of conversos and the violence escalated through Spain until 1474 when the Battle of Segovia caught the attention of Ferdinand and Isabella. According to the contemporary account, they ride in the day after the battle has been fought and there are still marks of fresh blood on the streets and on the walls of the houses. The city reeked from the number of slaughtered, the rotting carcasses, and the destruction. Now, Ferdinand and Isabella knew they had to act. And their action, this has to be underscored, was motivated by a desire to protect the conversos who had authentically embraced the faith. But they faced a problem. Back in 1391 with the first pogroms, right, the Jews seeking refuge from the mob could say, okay, okay, I'll be baptized. But now, these, these conversos have already been baptized. So what was required, if you will, was a new kind of baptism, so to speak, that would prove the legitimacy of, the, beyond a doubt, who were the true Christians and who were the Judaizers. It is in this spirit, the desire on the part of Ferdinand and Isabella to protect from oppression and to assimilate recent converts from Judaism, this is the spirit in which the Spanish Inquisition is born. This is a fact, my friends. Ferdinand was of converso blood. He was surrounded by converso advisors. It was from conversos and not from old Christians that the cry for the Inquisition came forth. Let us demonstrate our faith. 1478, Pope Sixtus IV, same Pope that the Pontecisto is named for, issued his famous bull, Exigit Sencerae Devotionis. The Catholic kings recommended Isabella's confessor, a Dominican priest named Tomas de Torquemada, who, according to one report, also may have been of converso blood. That's not established. At first, however, it seems he was just an advisor. The first active inquisitors were two Dominican priests, Miguel Morillo and Juan de San Martin. They were supervised by Cardinal Pedro Gonzalez de Mendoza. Now, one thing critics of the Spanish Inquisition ignore is that the Catholic monarchs were reluctant be to begin the Inquisition. So they shelled Sixtus's bull for two years, during which they created a program of catechetical instruction, just like this, to try to bring the Judaizers around. But it was not, it was well intended, but it was not successful. Further focusing the royal couple's urgency were the horroric horrific events that took place in 1480 in the town of Otranto in southeastern Italy where a Turkish squadron comes up to the town, they seize the town, they slay all the members of the town who refuse to convert to Islam, which is all of them. You know, it's a beautiful story. I don't know if all of you know it or not. They, they, they basically line up to be beheaded. Uh, the whole town stays true to the faith. It's a magnificent tale. But Islam is resurgent in southern Spain. The Turks are off the coast of Italy. Spain is in political, religious turmoil. Ferdinand and Isabella have to act. They are, there's urgency. They have to act. They take Sixtus's bull down from the shelf. Murillo and San Martin travel to Sevilla, the center of Converso, Spain. They declare a period of grace, and they go to work. Now, it was under these first two men that the zealous successes of the Spanish Inquisition took place. It must also be said that the first years of the Inquisition were bound to be the most active. Even as these two Dominicans were attempting to sort the wheat from the chaff, conversos not loyal to the church or to the crown were plotting their assassination. Among the conspirators were the leading citizens of Sevilla, as well as several conversos who had infiltrated the priesthood and the monastic life. The meeting of this conspiracy took place in a Catholic church. The crown learned of the plot. Arms for a hundred were discovered in the house of the dean of the cathedral. 
The conspirators were tried, and the very first auto de fe was held in Castile on February 6, 1481. It was in this atmosphere of a Muslim threat from without and converso threat from within that some 100,000 were eventually tried during the first few years of the Spanish Inquisition. Contrary to the later legends, however, only about 2,000 or 2% 2 were executed. Nonetheless, powerful converso families appealed to the Pope, who reacted without all of the evidence, asked the king and queen to restrain the Inquisition. Although fighting for the survival of Spain, this they did. What excesses or injustices there were, were quickly corrected when Tomas de Torquemada took over the Inquisition. So the man, the, the, the demon of the Inquisition, actually introduced temperance to this institution. Guided by Guy and Emmerich, he gave a formal structure of careful procedure, checks and balances. As a result, the Inquisition in Spain was more attentive to the rights of the accused than any other court in Europe and represented nothing less than a significant improvement in the practice of justice in the West. Many of the practices that we take, we take for granted today in the judging of a criminal uh, guilt or innocence find their expression in a system devised by Tomas Torquemada. Where instances of cruelty, vengeance, and persecution surface in the first years of the Spanish Inquisition, they are in violation of Torquemada's rules, not because of them. Further reforms take place under Jimenez. The numbers speak for themselves. Well under 2% of the accused were put to death. The Inquisition in Spain put to death over its three centuries between 3,000 and 5,000. In other words, about 16 a year. Okay? About 16 a year. Indeed, setting aside the, the overreaction of the first years, Fewer than three a year were put to death during the 16th and 17th century. The number is far fewer than capital sentences by any secular court of the age. The Spanish Inquisition persisted until 1834. Its endurance is a testament to the broad support it enjoyed among the Spanish people. Rather than attempt even to summarize the history of a three-century institution, let's conclude by clearing up some of the chief lies told by the inquisitors, Inquisition's detractors. Although much of, the uh, much of the myth of the Spanish Inquisition comes from Protestants, the Spanish Inquisition was never directed, uh, like, such as you know, John Fox, for example. The Spanish Inquisition was never directed at Protestants. Why not? The Protestant Rebellion never took hold in Spain. Never took hold in Spain. Nor was the Inquisition directed at Jews. As unbaptized persons Muslims and Jews fell outside of the authority of the Inquisition, outside of its jurisdiction. The auto de fe, or the act of faith, was a public religious ceremony that began with a high mass and concluded with the restoration to the faith those who had confessed their heresies. They would be given a public penance, such as the wearing of the San Benito, a yellow penitential tunic bearing the cross of St. Andrew. The condemned, those whose heresies were proven, but they would not repent. They were not burned at the auto de fe. No one was ever burned at an auto de fe. The executions took place outside the city. The work was performed by the civil authorities in the quemadero on the outskirts of the city. While torture was used in the Spanish Inquisition, the uh, Torquemada limited the use of the rack and the strapado, and he, he introduced the water torture. I'm not for any of these tortures, by the way, but this is certainly more humane, certainly more humane torture. It simulated drowning. Catholics shouldn't attempt to defend these tortures, then or now. But the Spanish Inquisition carefully regulated the use of torture, far more moderate and more infrequent than by use of the secular courts of Europe. Torture was employed in about 2% of cases. It required the approval of the bishop, the presence of a doctor. In fact, argues Jean Dumas, both qualitatively and quantitatively, the turning of the tide against the use of torture in modern history starts with the Spanish Inquisition. At any rate, the descriptions of torture that persist in popular imagination are per pure fiction. Edgar Allan Poe bears a good bit of the blame, but other anti-Catholic and anti-Spanish propagandists invented out of whole cloth scenes of torture. Here's one. An Englishman named Reverend Ingram Cobbin writing in a 19th century introduction to a, a reprint of Fox's Book of Martyrs, uh, writes, 
something that even Fox wouldn't have attempted in his book. He describes the instruments of torture. The fourth instrument of torture surpassed all the others in fiendish ingenuity. Its exterior was a large doll, richly dressed and having the appearance of a beautiful woman with her arms extended ready to embrace her victim. A semicircle was drawn around her and the person who passed over this fatal mark touched a spring which caused the diabolical engine to open its arms, immediately clasped him and a thousand knives cut him in as many pieces. I, actually, I would like to see that. <laughs> A French socialist from the 20th century wrote that victims condemned to death were roasted alive like meat in a cooking pot in hollowed limestone statues. Now there were statues in the Quemadera in Sevilla, the place of execution, but they were scenes of religious allegory sculpted by the Florentine companion of Michelangelo, Jacobo Florentino. And why were these sculptures put there? They were, they were, they were a last effort to stir the soul to thoughts of redemption. The terrible prisons of the Inquisition is another myth. The prisons of the Spanish Inquisition were superior to those of the secular courts throughout Europe for the quality of their sanitation, their lighting, and food. The num there are numerous cases of criminals accusing themselves of heresy in order to be transferred to the prisons of the Inquisition. Some were just confined to house arrest. Some were just told, don't leave the city. Were there long waits in prison? Yes, there were. But the methods of the Spanish Inquisition were slow and careful. And this explains why there would often be long waits. The argument that the Inquisition in Spain was the ruin of the Spanish Empire doesn't bear any scrutiny. Indeed, by helping to create religious unity in Spain, Torquemada shares the stage with Ferdinand and Isabella and Christopher Columbus as the principal builders of the foundation for Spain's Silo Doro, her golden age. Now some Catholics have tried to defend the church from accusations concerning the Spanish Inquisition, Inquisition by saying that it was an act of the civil government. This doesn't really bear much scrutiny. The Inquisition was proclaimed by the papacy, operated by Dominican and Franciscan priests, and supervised by the Episcopacy, Episcopacy of Spain. What is more, the Spanish Inquisition, ever short of funds, was heavily subsidized by the Holy See. Here, in 1578, the receipts of the Inquisitional Tribunal of Cordoba shows that more than half of its operating expenses came from the Holy See. Finally, although she bears the burden of public legend in this regard, the Catholic Church has not been the sole practitioner of trying, sentencing, and executing heretics. This was done with gusto in Protestant England under the Tudors and in Geneva under John Calvin. Moreover, when England was burning 30,000 witches, and Germany was burning about 100,000 witches. There was no witch burning in, in, in Spain for the subsequent grandeur of the Spanish Empire. The Spanish Inquisition, by rooting out heresy, also banished political disunity. United in faith, Spain was spared the brutal civil wars that tore apart Europe, England, and Ireland in the 17th century. Moreover, her unity equipped her to defend Europe against the Turk. And Americans should consider this. It is hardly a stretch to argue that the fiercely Catholic heart of Spain forged in seven centuries of fighting the enemies of Jesus Christ was kept pure by the Inquisition and fortified to carry the cross to the uh, new world. Didn't Pope John Paul II um, apologize to the Muslims uh, um, or for um, the Crusades? Okay, um, the question is, uh, did John, oh, you all heard the question. <laughs> uh, what, what John Paul, the second did is he expressed uh, sorrow and pain for the events of the Fourth Crusade, uh, particularly the, the sack of Constantinople. Um, there's nothing in, and, and by the way, that's not directed at Islam either, that apology, insofar as it was one. It was directed at our, our schismatic uh, brethren in the Orthodox churches. Um, but there's nothing in John Paul II where he where he doubts the merits of the enterprise of the Crusades. Similarly, with respect to the Inquisition, he does uh, commission, he commissioned in the late 90s a, a group of scholars. You know, one of the great things about the Inquisition is that, th that th there's an they kept very good records. I mean, there's a super abundance of records. So these new guys like Henry Kamen and, Ed and uh, Edward Peters, it's all there to read what actually happened. And so John Paul commissioned a bunch of scholars 
to look into what he did, you know, he described as, as a brutal time, a brutal age, but they discovered essentially what I'm telling you tonight, that uh, the legend that we have been told and, uh, for so long is far from, far from the truth, far from truth. Your handout indicates that uh, it was abolished in 1834. Why did it last so long and uh, what caused it to come to an end in 1834? It, it lasted so long because it was extremely popular with the Spanish people. The Spanish people loved it. They, it, they, they, lo they loved it. They loved the Inquisition. Um, it was dear to them, and dear, it was an institution that was dear to them. It ends in the beginning of the 19th century because of the events of the French Revolution, and then uh, Bonaparte, of course, comes down into Spain, and he puts his brother on the throne, right? And, uh, and then, and, and in fact, I'm glad you asked this question, because the first person to use the primary source documents, even before Charles Lea, who's an American, uh, at the end of the 19th century, is uh, uh, Llorente, L-L-O, Llorente. He was one of the priests of the Inquisition at the very end. So he gathers up a lot of, of the documents. He, he's a Bona, Bonaparte sympathizer. They had a name for it, like friend something something, you know, French sympathizer, whatever it is. And he gathers up all the, as many documents as he can. He goes to France for seven years, and he writes the first history of the Inquisition using primary source documents. Now, it's anti-Spanish and anti-Catholic because, you know, he, he was working for, 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 uh, for France, for, the, for Napoleon, but that's the first one. But that's how it lasted and why and, and how it ended. Chris, we have an a email coming in from Michael in Louisiana who asks um, that the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 2297, and the following teaches that torture is against the dignity of the human being. Yet you noted that three popes allowed for torture in the Inquisition. Is the catechism wrong or were the three popes wrong? And finally, how do you reconcile that with papal infallibility? Well, the, the papal infallibility one is an easy question. The, 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 per, the permitting of torture was not an ex cathedra statement. Uh, saying, yes, torture is good or torture is evil. It, it wasn't anything like that. It was an expedient that was permitted by the Holy See and it was a common uh, legal practice of the age. Um, by the way, I oppose torture, uh, just to go on the record there, maybe you're taping this part. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I oppose its use by the American government. Uh, I'm against it and I agree with the catechism on that point. Uh, but, but this is why at the beginning I, 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 I went uh, uh, probably longer than I needed to, trying to make the point that the only way we're going to get our imagination around this event is if we can start to think like a medieval. And, and to the medieval, uh, it was generally accepted. Although, as I said, uh, Nicholas Emmerich himself believed that um, torture was probably not useful. And the, the trial of the Templars, and I think I've given that Templars talk here, uh, the, the confessions that they made under really brutal torture that went on a lot longer than 15 minutes, you know, confined to a pit and all this stuff, um, it, confessed to all kinds of wicked acts, absolutely uh, would not pass muster in any court of law today. Did I dodge that question pretty well? That was pretty good, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris. Oh, wait, 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 there's oh, one more. Oh, we have one more? Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. Huh. We probably have a lot more. Uh -huh. Um, if the actions of the Inquisition were, sounds like are fairly understated vis-a-vis -vis what other courts were doing across Europe at the time, um, I'm just wondering why was it so seized upon by people to create myths if it, in fact, was so understated? Yeah, excellent question. Well, Spain is the is the victim of what we call the Black Legend, and uh, and, it, and it begins uh, with Protestant England and. And, you know, and, and, and the Dutch Calvinists as well. And so when it really picks up steam um, during the reign of Philip II, I really highly recommend, I know I've said this before, the William Thomas Walsh biography of Philip II that I put at the top there. Um, but, uh, but the whole business of the Armada, uh, it, it, the, the image that had to be created in order to uh, fire the hearts of English was here come the ships laden with the torture devices of the Spanish Inquisition and they're going to impose this 
the, the same wicked practices and, and cruel practices on us uh, that they're doing that they're doing to their own people in Spain. Well, the reality is, I mean, who, who are the who are the people of the West that have come up with the singularly most wicked, vile way of putting somebody to death? It's the English. I'm sorry if there are any English here. Drawing and quartering someone and pulling his guts out while he's still alive it has it all over the Inquisition, and so uh, uh, so. Uh, uh, Elizabeth burned people, Ed Edward burned people, Mary Tudor burned people, we should be honest about that too. So um, it's, it's, it's anti-Catholic propaganda. And the reason is, uh, there's a supernatural reason for what you're asking too. And that is because the devil hates the Catholic Church. It's the thing he hates the most on this earth. And so he's using whoever he can to create hatred and misunderstanding towards the church. It's, uh, I saw a news article from CNN and The Guardian saying that Christopher Columbus was a converso. Is that true? I don't know if he was or not. He may have been of converso blood. I don't know that that's demonstrated. He certainly had conversos in his, in his um, uh, close, uh, among his close associates. And, and, he, and I believe he took Jews with him as well on, uh, you know, out and out Jews. Uh, on his voyage because they spoke, they tended to speak Arabic and some of them had some oriental languages and he was thinking that he was going to need a, uh, a translator. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah, read um, Admiral of the Ocean Sea by, thank you, thank you, brilliant, brilliant. One of the greatest biographies, wouldn't you say, I mean, Samuel Elliot Morrison, yeah, a brilliant biography. And he has one for boys too called Mariner, which is a short version. God, Columbus is an amazing guy. We should do a program on Columbus. Yeah. What do you guys think? Program on Columbus? <laughs> Chris Rechek. All right. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. Yeah. Oh.